Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the online symposium, Earth Climate Dreams, Depth Psychological Reflections in the Age of the Anthropocene. I'm Bonnie Bright, and we're back here for this session with Dr. Michael Conforti, who's a Jungian analyst. Hi, Dr. Conforti. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for the interview. I look forward to this tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's really great to have you here, and you know, we've actually known each other for quite some time now, and your work has been just so profoundly instrumental, I think, in being able to begin to understand the archetypes and patterns that are at work in our culture. And so I think this is a particularly fascinating topic to be looking at how those patterns are emerging in our relationship to the earth and the, the cultural and social issues that are really facing us today. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. Let me jump in by reading your bio first so that everybody has more background about you and then we'll go for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Michael Conforti is a union analyst and the founder and director of the Assisi Institute. He has been a faculty member at the C.G. Jung Institute Boston, the C.G. Jung Foundation of New York, and for many years served as a senior associate faculty member in the doctorate and master's programs in clinical psychology at Antioch, New England. A pioneer in the field of matter psyche studies, Dr. Conforti is actively investigating the workings of archetypal fields and the relationship between union psychology and the new sciences. He has presented his work to a wide range of national and international audiences, including the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich and union organizations in Venezuela, Denmark, Italy, and Canada. And you were just telling me Russia as well, and there's probably more. That list is continuing to grow, of course. Mm -hmm. Dr. Conforti is the author of Threshold Experiences, The Archetype of Beginnings, which is now uh, being translated into Russian, actually, and Field, Form, and Fate, Patterns in Mind, Nature, and Psyche. And of course, he's, his articles have appeared in numerous union and other publications. Dr. Conforti maintains a private practice in Mystic, Connecticut and consults with individuals and corporations around the world. He provides his insights as a sought after consultant to businesses, government institutions and the film industry. And he's been asked to consult on the application of field theory to the understanding and resolution of international border disputes and was selected by the Club of Budapest and University of Potsdam to be part of a 20-member international team of physicists, biologists, and dynamical systems theorists to examine the role and influence of informational fields. And he's currently working on a new book, Hidden Presence, Archetypes, Spells, Possessions, and the Complex. So Michael, you have so much going on, and I know that you are a very busy person, and so it's really extra meaningful that you have elected to join us here in the symposium. And again, I, I'm just really looking forward to picking your brain a little bit on your understanding of what what's happening to us on the planet here today, because things just seem to me to be a little bit out of whack. I don't know if it's just me. It's a little. <laughs> but obviously anybody who's watching this right now or listening to it is very aware that there's something that is not quite right. And, and there's a number of reasons for that. And we've heard already some of the speakers in the symposium who have providing theories and ideas about what that might be. And of course, I think a fundamental one that most people understand, at least in the, from a depth psychological perspective, is the, the split between nature and psyche. The fact that we as humans have separated ourselves out from the rest of nature. And, and there's some good things about that because our culture has really blossomed and flourished and there's a, a lot of creative, amazing things that come out of there. But we are entering now what's called the age of the Anthropocene, which is, where humans have just made such a tremendous impact on the planet that we are no longer able to maintain that balance that is so greatly needed in order for the world to be sustainable. So I think that we're headed for some, some pretty serious challenges as we move forward. But you are proposing that part of the reason is that there is an archetype that is emerging and, and it's that of narcissism. And I don't know if you've referred to it as an archetype. I guess that's maybe the way that I think about it. But I wonder if we can start off by just talking a little bit about narcissism and, and what that means to you and how you view that and, and how that, of course, ultimately is, is going to play into our relationship to the planet. Well, look, number one, I think it's great you're tackling this, these kind of topics. And towards the end of Jung's life, he and a lot of the really, you know, the Jungians that spent their life studying this stuff, they began looking at world issues. And I think you're on to something very important with this, because I think a lot of the brilliant work that Jung and, you know, as you know, well, I, I like to honor the elders, you know, von Franz and um, Mario Jacobi and a lot of the greats, Marion Woodman, Hillman, they, these are pioneers. And they were so great, Barbara Hanna and all, they knew there was something real about psyche. To them, it wasn't a theory, it wasn't a 
a product of your imagination. It was as real as the sun and the moon and as real as eating and all of that stuff. So what they realized in the latter part of their lives were that, you know, all this work looking at movements of psyche, that there's something arising for sometimes really great things, sometimes, as we know, some bad reason. They said, if you can begin to, to sense it, almost like a, a weatherman, what do you call it, a meteorologist, you can maybe help something. And, and how do you begin applying? When we look at, there's a war coming in one psyche, say your dreams or my dreams, there's, there's a battle. How do we apply it to the outer world? The ideas of projection, the idea, all of these things. So anyway, it's a way of saying, great work. And then I think it's, and I really applaud you and the other people that are addressing these issues. And I think it's in the spirit of where Jung would be going today. It, it, maybe that's important. It's important to me to think about that. Not, I don't idealize him, but his vision was, was just profound. Yeah. So that's number one. Narcissism, you know. <laughs> Let's begin with, with Freud and narcissism. He, he identified two levels of narcissism. And I know we want a bad mouth for it. Freud was brilliant up to a point like anybody. He held a torch and he made some wonderful discoveries in his time, in his era. He did good things. And then he, we see the limitations. <clears throat> but when he talked about primary and secondary narcissism, primary narcissism is when we want to please ourselves. The little baby. The little baby wants to do whatever, you know, all the things babies do. And all the things babies play with. And that's how the world should be, because the world should be for them. And I remember my son, he was eight years old, eight and a half, get ready for nine. And he said, Christopher, up to this point, the world's all about you. When you turn nine, it's going to be a little change. It's all about me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, why, Daddy? Well, just wait. We watch what happens. But I was kidding him because I said, look, everything I do right now, and of course, I would do it forever, but it was all about you. Every meeting and school and basketball practice and art lesson and whatever, I did my best to be there because I wanted it to be the world for him. And he looked around the world and said, this is my place. I'm safe in it. So when Freud talked about primary narcissism, he's saying it's a time in our life, necessary, right? Necessary phase development when we should be able to find pleasure and the people around us find ways to please us. I mean, healthy, nothing perverse. And it's normal. It's totally normal. Secondary narcissism is really when you, you kind of read between the lines. And I don't know if Freud said it so much. A secondary narcissism begins the development of a moral psyche because you want to be able to please others. I mean, with my wife and with my kids, you say, you know what? I bet Laura Lee would really love this. I know she would really... This is the meal I want tonight, but you know, I don't think she wants squid and octopus. I think she would really like this other meal. Or I think she would love going to this ballet because she, you know, or, and you get pleasure out of it. And it's not a pleasure saying, hey, look what I did for you. I'm such a great guy. I did a wonderful thing for you. And I hope you enjoy it because of what I did. But it's a genuine pleasure. And I think in many ways, secondary narcissism relates to a very deep kind of spirituality. And it was... Um, Thomas Merton, who said that charity is when you expect nothing in return. And many of the great uh, scholars and rabbis, they always said, you know, charity also should be given anonymously. And I, I, I love a friend of mine, he, he and his wife are involved in Africa, some of the really rough African tribes where they literally, you know what we say? I don't know where my next meal is coming from. They don't know where the next meal is coming. They got to forage. And they sent them all this stuff from helping them get some money to build water uh, pumps and all that and get some schools and, and better foraging tools. And they sent it anonymously. At first, I said, why'd you do it? And he, the guy explained this to me. And I was very, very impressed. I never heard that before, giving anonymously. Because so often people say, you know what I gave? You know what I gave Bonnie? You know what Bonnie gave Mike? You know, and, and it gets all convoluted. So anyway, when you begin looking at primary and secondary narcissism, I think many of us still function as adults in the world, political leaders, spiritual leaders, no, religious, not spiritual, religious leaders and all, as primary narcissists, where we're looking to find what we can take for ourselves. And, you know, and that, I think, gets into a lot of the environmental things you're talking about. Look, I... I'm getting ready for a big fishing trip. I got friends coming. We're going to go Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's rough because you know what? If you've ever 
gun fishing, it's addictive. You catch two fish, you want four fish, you want six fish, and then you can't wait and if the boat is loaded up with fish and say, what the hell did I just do? <laughs> it's literally addictive. It's crazy making. Of course, we eat everything and we share it with my family and, and send it down to New York to my father and everything. But you forget. And I remember reading a fishing report one day, one of the boats I've gone on before, and they say, it was a slaughter. We slaughtered the fish. And I thought, oh my God, it's such an insult. I mean, I think of the native people that would throw a piece of the bone back, a piece of the whalebone back and say, thank you, you know, for letting us have you and feeding our families and clothing and blubber and all that. Slaughter, the damn slaughter. And again, you want to catch a lot of fish, but you realize this other side is we're depleting things. Yeah. So where does that take us? I'm wondering, you know, as a culture, because it occurs to me that, I mean, I get the thing about the fish. Now, maybe it's not fishing for me. It might be something else. But each of us, I think, can relate to exactly what you're saying. It's, it, we all have something that's what you just called addicting. And I, I don't know if you meant that in the clinical sense necessarily, but on some level, all of us have the things that we want. And we often are in a position to be able to pursue some of those things that we want to be able to do. We're very privileged, particularly in the country that we live in. Yeah. And I want to just acknowledge that and honor it. But when we want something, we want something. And our culture has really developed to a, a you know, stage where often we are able to go out and get what we want or go out and do what we want. I mean, consumerism has just become absolutely rampant. And and so I, I do see what you're saying. It's absolutely a form of narcissism because technically we should have the ethical concern about what's happening around us and be able to mitigate that addiction or that desire for what it is we want to do. But, but I think your use of the word addiction is actually quite um, pertinent because in, in addiction, as we know, you are unable to control those those urges most of the time without some outside help or some behavioral change or, or whatever that is. And so <laughs> it kind of circles us back to this conundrum that we're in. If, if we're all suffering from narcissism, if our culture is supporting the notion that we can pretty much have whatever we want, that we don't have to do without, that everything is in the moment and we can, you know, it's that whole immediate gratification thing. How can we take an archetypal perspective on this and begin to tease out the patterns that are at work here? And how, how do we stop or slow or shift that pattern and that vicious kind of cycle that we're in? Well, uh, you know, addiction, let's look at addiction archetypally first and as we move on. Addiction is a fixation and a possession of a particular stable attractor. Okay, to use a, a theory of a complexity theory to describe it, chaos theory. There's, there's an attractor, stable or periodic attractor, and we're drawn. Fishing, fishing, books, books, more and more plants, more plants, whatever, more. And, and we are, we continue to be driven by that attractor and we were like moths to a flame and it does lead to rampant consumerism it, it leads again back not back but i think it's an expression of this incredible primary narcissism how do we begin changing i mean that's a million dollar question and i think one take i have on this and something i thought about for a long time is that we're living in a time of an absence of real leaders you need to Everybody needs a model. If you take a family as a beginning, um, kind of a schematic for how we make changes, okay? You have a family. When you have a dysfunctional family, basically we do a lot of dysfunctional things. And I'm not trying to be reductive about it or mechanistic, but to use work in field theory, you become a, in, involved in this field of dysfunction. And how many kids play it out one way or another? If you have somebody, and even in dysfunctional homes, there's maybe that one uncle or that grandma, that grandmother you love, a grandfather you love, and say, you know what? I remember grandpa taking walks with him and used to go to the park and feed the birds. My grandfather came from Calabria. And Calabria, and he used to go out and make gardens out of nothing. You know, it would take five years and build a garden out of sand. It was unbelievable. And he was the gentlest man. And I remember, and I remember all that. And I grew up not so gentle in my environment. So, in the absence of a figure that can hold it, especially now when we, we leave our families, we go into the wider world. We, you know, we're all cosmopolitan, we're all global citizens. You tell me, Bonnie, where do you see a lot of people you really respect? I mean, let's be real. People you can say, wow. To me, I've had a few. I mean, I've had a mentor for many years, uh, Dr. Yoram Kaufman, who not only was a physicist and a youngie, but I found out after he passed away, he was a Kabbalist for many, many years. 
and one of the wisest people I ever met, Robert Langs, absolutely brilliant. And Ely Wiesel, who just passed away. And the people I would consider, either with Wiesel, it wasn't personal. I just met him once or twice, once. The other ones I knew, and I said, if I, if I have an issue, I could talk to them. And I know it's going to be a, a very thoughtful response. And not just, how do you feel about it? What do you think about it? But, but you knew somebody who's, who recognizes something different about the world, something that most people don't see. I don't see much of that anymore. I mean, it, it, let's be subtle. I'm not usually subtle, but how many things in psychology, how many ideas come out of psychology? You say, my God, it never, it never dawned on me. It never dawned on me. Like in religion, I remember reading a piece by Ely Wiesel. He said, why did God choose Abraham? He said, I never, I never asked the question. It never dawned on me to ask a question, why him? And he went to give this brilliant, you know, commentary. There's a Talmudic commentary on the story. I don't see it. I don't see many people asking great questions. And I don't want to get to the whole political thing. I mean, we can. I mean, everyone's sitting that note. But, I mean, you're going to tell me these two people are leaders? Give me a break. Give me a break. I mean, the, the rampant narcissism of these two people, and who knows what's true. But where are the people? You know, who was it? Paula, Paula Cole? Where are, my, where are the cowboys? Where are all the cowboys? Where are the heroes gone? Mm-hmm. And that's not a little kid saying, I want a hero. I want my daddy here. I want Superman. There got to be some people come up and stepping up that have more to offer, that are not just taken down by the collective and, and by the rhetoric. Jung was, Jung was outside of the circle of the collective in the sense that he paid his dues. He was a brilliant psychiatrist. He was a brilliant Freudian analyst before he became a Jungian. And he did his work. I mean, look at what he did. Look what he produced. Look what von Franz produced. How many books? And not, not judging by that, but they did their work. Where do we see it today? Yeah. You tell me. Yes, and, and I think that you're bringing up something for me, which is absolutely critical to that leadership, and that is also the fact that our leadership is traditionally very rationally oriented. Well, <laughs> you might take exception to that. <laughs> when the, by the time this airs, you got to you for that one. <laughs> may not be the same thing, but I do think that what we are really sadly missing in our in our culture is also the feminine approach. And by feminine approach, I don't mean a woman, obviously, but mm-hmm. from a union standpoint, there's something there that is really deeply missing and, and has been ingrained in our culture for a long time that we we favor the more masculine approach over a more feminine approach. I know that you have listed some of your mentors and the people that you really, you know. And they uh, were men, I admit it. Yeah. And, and I know that Eric Neumann has done a lot of work on that. And I've heard you talk about his work as it relates to the, the feminine in particular. Maybe we should go that route and talk a little bit about what that role or missing element, I should say, has to do with this whole issue around narcissism and the way that we're treating the planet. Neumann hit that beautifully in the tail end of Origins of History of Consciousness. I mean, it's a great book, which is really about, I think, redemption of the feminine. There really are misogynistic overtones and all that's true, but it it's really a call, I think, to, to respect and worship again. Towards the latter part of the book, I forget which chapter it is. I don't know if it's Centroversion, one of them. He talks about humanity's fear and terror of the feminine. And he, it's, it's brilliant what he says. He said, look at the machines. Look at our new um, bulldozers, for instance. Wheels as big as a house, 30 feet high, a wheel on a bulldozer. I'll never forget one day I was watching this thing take the a machine taking down trees. It was like a giant razor blade that spins and it goes up the top of the tree and shreds it in a matter a beautiful tree bun in a matter of probably 10 minutes. It shredded the, the, the toothpicks. And, and what Neumann's point is, he said, we develop more and more this technology to attempt to subdue nature and the feminine because of why? We're terrified. We're terrified because nature is not going to be subdued. The oceans are not going to be subdued. No matter how great a sailor you are, the ocean is more powerful than you. Nature, no matter where you, no matter how you build your house, there's the earthquakes, and, and then you get the feminine, which is, I'm sorry, I've, I've thought about this for years. The mystery of giving birth, and I'm not trying to make it biological, but that there is something so powerful about the archetypal experience of not the literal, but the way a woman does give birth to things. I mean, I watch what Laura Lee, my wife, has done in the Seeing Red Project. I look what you've done over the how many years building this thing. 
it was it was it was built in a way a woman builds things. It's more relational. And I don't want to make it that simple, relational and whatever. But there is a different way a woman goes about giving birth to something. And I think the man's way, and again, I, I remember where I was, and I said this publicly for the first time four or five years ago. I was in Seattle giving a lecture. I said, <clears throat> I think the experience of the male psyche has, has, hit a, has hit a wall. We've gone as far as we can in its current, what, its current evolution? It's, 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 it's sad. It's sad in many ways. When you watch what the men, men and leaders and men in sports and men in business, I, I grew up, I, yeah, right, I mentioned three men. I grew up, I'm a mother's, I'm a mother's son. I'm the only son in my family, Italian family, right? And I grew up where many of the kids, would, the nephews and nieces would hang around with the men. You know, I spent all my time in the kitchen with the mothers. I found it more meaningful. All my time was in the kitchen and sitting around with them and listening to them. I didn't find the men's stuff interesting. I played ball, I was always a good athlete and all that, but that wasn't my center orientation. And so I generally, I, I feel ashamed in a lot of ways when I watch, when I look around and see what's happening to the masculine psyche today. And you see in dreams, the, the shift, this huge shift, and no one knows what it's gonna be, but there's something coming. And it's a dismantling, it's a dismantling and it's a new, it's not iteration. The iteration is the same process. There's a whole new development taking place. And I think it's around the understanding it's got to be something with the feminine. Why, why, why all the energy around Hillary as a president? It's not Hillary as a president. It's the need for feminine leadership. I mean, I think that's the, the biggest archetypal thing you could say about it. I mean, who she is, come on, yeah, we, we could talk about that. But anyway, but I think you're hitting the big point. That's the big thing Neumann got. It was much of our technology, whether medical, whether technological, whether uh, outer world with bulldozers and skyscrapers. We're going to make it bigger and sharper and, and whatever. We're going to find every cell in our body. And thank God in many ways, but it's also an attempt, as he writes in the little subtitles and chapters, trying man and humans trying to subdue nature. Yeah. Yes. And that brings us to something that I, I just can't get away from. And it's particularly poignant for me right now. When you were talking about the bulldozer that was taking the, the trees down like a razor blade, I just had this visceral bodily reaction that I just, I mean, it literally hurts me when I hear that. And um, it, it, it's not, you know, I don't know how many people are actually experiencing those kinds of images like you just described as on a visceral level like that but i suspect that that's becoming more and more prominent and of course uh, one of the other presenters in the symposium jerome bernstein talks about that a lot in his book living in the borderland and the capacity for some of us to begin to feel that uh really an attempt by nature to reach out to us in order to kind of bring us back into that sort of state of balance that we need but you just referred to something that i think is really critically important and that is in this whole discussion of the masculine way versus the feminine way. And, and when you say we need feminine leadership, of course, it doesn't mean it has to be a woman. It could be a man who has a feminine way of doing things. But a lot of it really comes down to this idea of objectification as well. And our capacity as human beings, as you know, people in the age of the Anthropocene, to be able to really objectify those things in the world around us that we do not deem to have life, intelligence, and um, essence of their own. And of course, this is this has not always been the case. Earth-based peoples have always believed that, and it's something that we're so missing in our culture. So this capacity for uh, objectification becomes something very different than more of an eros relatedness kind of thing. And, and I guess I tend to relate that to the feminine as well, that more eros and relatedness and community rather than the objectification, the seeing the life in all things. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, it, two ways to respond to that. One is it does go back to primary narcissism when it all, when it all taken back to us, right? It's still us and, and objectifying and pleasing us and all. The other piece, it, it, it's a great, great point you're making is that if you look at the way Jung and the early, early, early Jungians in particular, worked with images. Say you dream of an eagle, you dream of a, a salmon, you dream of a polar bear, you know, black bear, whatever. The brilliant approach that they would take is look at the nature of the animal. I'm sure there are many ways to talk about this. Maybe shamans are different languages too. They say the same thing. They would feel into the animal. 
-hmm. and learn about it. What is different about a polar bear and a black bear? And I remember watching some uh, African movie one and they were doing these dances and they, the dancers became, they really worked to become the ostrich that they danced or the raven that they did. And the movements were perfectly aligned to the movements of that animal. They entered the field of it. So in many ways, you use your word eros, I think when you really enter the field of an image and you work with psyche by getting away from yourself, not just what you think and what you feel and what you want, but say, what, what is it that humanity has known about ego since the beginning of time? Of course we have personal association, but there's something bigger. And you know, by what you're hitting is so powerful because it gets to, I think, some of the beauty of where the archetypal and Jungian approach adds to you, the, the whole discussion here. Because when you realize that these images are real, number one, they have a life of their own, they have their own ontology, they get their own rites of passage, they get their own initiatives, and when you enter it, you kind of just be quiet for a while and then not what okay, not just what you and I think about this, but what have the native people thought? What have fairy tales told us about the ego? What has it told us about whatever? And you say, My God, there's something universal here. The minute you do that, do you realize what's happening? It's a level of arrows with something greater than yourself. It's the beginning of, a, I think, a truly spiritual experience without all the bells and whistles necessarily. Because it's in, in psychology, let's, you know, psychology today is rampant with, the, again, primary narcissism. What do you think? What does it feel? If you think the ego means money because it's the ego on a dollar bill, it's about money. Oh, come on, let's stop it. Is this really what would, was this why Jung and the early ones spent so many years like studying the image of sulfur, studying the image of the negredo because they want to make it what they wanted it to? They knew it was something real. And, and I think it develops a relationship with a wider world when you do that. And it, it gets us out of this me and mine and whatever. So that when you look at the world and you look at the tree, like you said, and you could say, my God, that, that tree is being slaughtered. I mean, slaughter is such, I mean, it's one thing to cut it down, but this life, 60, 80, 100 year old tree, taking down the toothpicks in three, in five minutes, if you can't feel it, it means you have, there's something that numbed you. So I don't like it when I watch the fish die. I don't like it. I really don't. The first time I went years ago, it was traumatic. It was really traumatic. But I do think your word eros is huge, and it means having a relationship with something that's just not about our own particular biases and feeling. When you love somebody, you love somebody because there's something in them that you care about. I asked somebody once years ago, I said, why do you love your wife? He said, what? <laughs> I said, why do you love her? He said, well, I can't tell you why, but I can tell you what I love about her. And he went on and just went on for a while and told me things he really loved about her. And he thought it was precious. And it wasn't about just things he valued. He loved the way she would just turn a phrase or the way she would do the bookcase, like I'm looking behind you right now. And there was something about it that touched him deeply, and he saw her. I mean, how many relationships? Let's take it home, right? How many relationships are filled with me? You watch people dance. You know, in Brooklyn, they all dance with the thumbs. They all get to move with the thumb. So it's cute for a minute. Can you, can you dance with the person you're with and watch their moves? Do you make love in the way you want to make love every time? Or do you were able to, to, to dance with someone? You know, it, that's why this is a huge issue. It's a huge issue you're touching on. And, and I'm proud to be part of it. But I, and I do come back that it's something about being able to get beyond the it's me in my world. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And, and at the same time that you say that, you know, I, I'm really kind of in this place where I'm ambivalent because I'm, I'm so aware of how much we are really embedded into this, this sense of, of being selfish or being narcissistic. I looked up the origins of the word uh, narcissist. And of course, we, most of us know that it comes from the Greek myth of Narcissus, who fell in love with his own image when he gazed into a pool and of course ended up uh, dying and being turned into a flower. I guess there's various versions of the story. But I, I think that we're gazing at ourselves in such a, a tremendous way. And yet, 
there is something at work that has the capacity to wake us up. I've had that experience and I suspect almost everybody who's listening to this has had that experience, whether it's a huge major awakening that completely changed your life or whether it's those moments that you can point to where you just had this sudden realization that you were not just you in this little body, in this little skin, but you were part of something that was greater. That's a spiritual experience. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Maybe have a session sometime where people share some of these. Yeah, I agree completely. That's a great idea. And I, I mean, you've been a clinical psychologist for a long time. So I'm sure that you have seen a lot of things over those you know, decades of, of the time that you've spent with clients. But do you, do you feel like this is a, maybe I'm, I'm just looking for the, the hope here, because sometimes it's hard not to be overwhelmed with some, something akin to despair when you start to see what's happening around us. But do you do you have an experience of seeing this kind of a transition? And you referred to a larger transition, something's at work, you know, something is changing. Do you see that kind of overtake people or how does that happen? Is it over years of therapy or what is the process that you, that you think this can, um, that can be supported or uh, allow it to emerge in a, a different way than we have been seeing in the past and make an actual change to the culture? Well, number one about the issue of being hopeful. I mean, I, uh, I think Trump is really using the, the, his Trump card a lot. The world's horrible. The world's horrible. The world's in rough. It is in rough shape. There's no question about it. And there are still acts of beauty. I mean, I saw the thing on Facebook the other day. The White Hats, I think they called them, right? The guys in Syria that are crying and they go into the the rubble, risking their own lives, saving these babies. And and you you see. I mean, it's such a crazy, crazy image. It makes you nuts. On one hand, how wonderful. And the other one, how horrible. <laughs> you know, the poor babies ripped apart. The other piece, let's go back to narcissism. Yeah, we all know the myth of narcissism, but we forget one piece many times. Narcissus did what he did, and he was frozen at the pond because he had never seen himself. He was conceived in rape. He was conceived that his mother was raped by the river god. And many people that remain rampant narcissists have never known that kind of genuine, real love. If you're loved, you want to give to somebody else. I mean, I like, we like nothing better than inviting people to a house and have dinner. We have six people coming in half an hour tonight for dinner. If you don't know that benevolence, it's hard. And somewhere in the course of a treatment with somebody, I mean, many people come to you for different reasons, you know. And... If you get to a point when you can open up to something bigger, that's the moment of transition. And when a, a healthy porousness comes into your life, when you can embrace something that you never thought you could ever embrace, you allow something to come in. To allow something to come in means you're not as guarded and it means you're more secure in your life. And that's where it's a whole stadial developmental process where you got to get secure enough and have a good or strong enough ego to allow yourself to break down a little bit. And one of the things I love doing in treatment and what you're saying, what you're asking, is to find that one thing that could bring somebody to their knees. It may be writing for somebody. It may be grooming a dog or a cat. It may be the, like Laura Lee's sister, her world is very much about children. She's an incredible childcare. That's her life, I think. I think she's in the archetypal field and I think she does it consciously and she's a gift to these little kids she works with. And if you can get to that moment when somebody can say, yes, this really touches me so deeply when I do this. It's, and hopefully you can see it in somebody else. When you say, I remember my grandfather. When my grandfather picked mushrooms, he was, he was somewhere else. When he made wine, he was somewhere else. That You need a model. And, and, and I just hope we can have more of those times that they don't get eclipsed by all the rampant and obvious violence that's around us. That's where I think the hope comes in. And, you know, not that you want to just say hope's going to be one person at a time, but when you can see something like those white hats, I mean, it's just incredible. Watch what they did in, like you with your experience about the tree being mowed down. Who could not watch that video and be deeply moved? That could be the opening for somebody to say, you know what, these people are risking their lives for strangers, like 9-11, right? They're risking their lives, people they don't know. It must be something good in the world, something good in the human heart that doesn't just 
become calcified and just wants to protect itself. I mean, you talk, we're going back to the original primary, secondary narcissism. What these rescuers do, come on. I hope to God I would do the right thing. I don't know what I would do. I'm not going to be arrogant. Of course I do the right thing in a situation with my 9-11. I hope to God I would. Side of the road, something happens. I hope to God I would do the right, the so-called right thing. But to give your life to somebody and, and to, to risk giving your time to someone, that's, that's how I think all this opens up. And to be, we can encourage this. And this is where I think therapy, I've been doing this work 40 years now almost. And if you can help somebody understand it, it's, you gotta have an ego, of course, it's essential. But the work is really about being open to things that are bigger than your own sphere of influence. That's, I think, what it's really about. And when I see it happen with somebody, oh my God, that's when you say, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. Yeah. Yeah, because the transformation is so profound. And of course, even Jung suggested that in order to change a, a larger group, in order to change the culture, we need to each be doing our individual work. It's interesting because this came up in a conversation that I was having with a group not too long ago and somebody said, how do we get somebody else to see this? <laughs> we were talking about almost some, something very similar, mm -hmm. in fact. And and, and my initial response was, and I don't know if, if you would agree with that or not, but sometimes it's not about making other people see. Sometimes it's about us just doing that work on ourselves. And then that gives the opportunity for the entire situation to shift because there are all of these invisible dynamics that are at work under the surface. And some of it is very much coming from that that greater what Jung called the self with a capital S. And in fact, I, I never closed on that thought that I started to talk about how I looked up the, the origins of the word narcissist. And it, it really spoke to, there was some mention in the place that I looked it up about how somebody is enamored with oneself. So basically in love with oneself, right? But if I take that and I translate oneself, which we normally think of, to one's self with a capital S, then it becomes something completely different. And that's the real issue in, narcissism, in, in the story of Narcissus. He never had a chance to see himself. For the first moment, he saw, you're right, the big self for the first time. Right. And he said, remember the words? I mean, the, the words are gorgeous. He's looking at himself in the, in the pond and he says, am I to woo you or are you to woo me? He, di he didn't know who it was. He didn't know it was him. He didn't know that that self was, the big self was part of him because he never was mirrored. He was never loved by anybody. So, I mean, there are so many pieces to the, what you're getting at tonight and what we're talking about. And I think there's a lot of room for some meaningful talks here. Yeah. Yes, and, and that's the intention really is I think that, again, anybody who is beginning to wake up to this or is carrying this, and, and certainly a lot of us who are very aware of the, the crisis that we're facing, both on social level as well as an ecological level, because it's all connected, of course. You know, some of us are feeling a lot of trauma around this, whether it's conscious or maybe even slightly unconscious. And it's causing, I think, some people to act out and it's causing some people to just be really distressed about it. And so there's, there's definitely a need for us to come together in community to have conversations like this, to be able to have this kind of exposure to people who are thinking about these issues on a daily basis. It does create, I think, those openings that we're, we're talking about exactly for us to become more related with that larger self and with others who are in that space as well. Yeah, I agree. And you know, I, I think as you're talking, I always liked Aesop's fables. And there was one of the fables where there's a comment, there's a commentator that says something about, and this is a story about virtue, and this is a story about whatever. And I think we need some people to, to be commentators on this. I mean, it's, when wonderful acts happen, at some point to say, Maybe later, over a glass of wine or something, or over well, taking a walk, you say, that was so beautiful, how you just opened yourself up to another person, how you gave so generously of yourself. And I think about that because, like, in a lot of the movies, wonderful things happen. We're touched, we cry, we laugh, whatever, in the movie. And we go out, we have a glass of wine, and then whatever we can. That was a good movie. You forget about it. Because somehow, the firewall to the heart doesn't remain open. There's something about when you say it and when there's an image. And in the introduction to 
uh, Origins, Neumann book, they say something beautiful. They said, Jung and, and Neumann said the same thing. They said, the psyche produces images because the image excites us and invites us to want to get to know it. Isn't that beautiful? And so the movie image, the fable, the story, the event, the tree, whatever, the, the, the dead fish, it's an image, it's reality. And it, it invites us to get to know if you can remain open and there's any way you can encourage that receptivity. That's your gift. Yeah. That's your gift. Yeah. Yeah. And that speaks to dreams as well. So, you know, if people who are listening with this aren't paying attention to their dreams, maybe that's a good place to start because that's where the images are just given to us on a platter. Mm -hmm. And we, I, of course, you can see them in the world around you if you're paying attention. But I think the dreams are a special uh, approach in, and a key piece of what we're talking about here as well. I agree a million percent. I mean, sometimes the dream comes with such a clarity and such a beauty. And you really, my God, I've been trying to understand this for a year. And now the image comes and just, like you said, it hands it to you on a platter sometimes. It's a different approach to life. And it's an it's approach, again, I go back to the elders, where they knew this stuff was real. I mean, remember the movie Clash of the Titans, Ian Nielsen, a couple of years ago? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the King Agamemnon said, we don't need them. They're gods no more. We're the gods. Look at my daughter. She's more beautiful than anyone. Daddy, no, 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 no. And the gods are saying, you can hear Robert De Niro. You talking to me? I don't think you're talking to me, says Zeus. Give him a thunderbolt. <laughs> Give him a storm. And, you know, we effectively worked to, de to dismantle and go back to von Franz when she talks in a, in a brilliant discussion about projection and introjection. You know, we began in the world by projecting everything onto the gods and, and nature and participation mystique and... And projection was the way we began. Mommy, mommy's the most beautiful and the biggest in the world, the greatest, daddy, the best, you know, whatever it might be. And so we begin by virtual projection. Things are out there. Development then requires that there is a introjection. Thus comes the danger. Because introjection means you're, okay, I can have some of what mommy has and maybe have some of that in me too. Some of daddy stuff, you know, I could do some of that too. I could do some of what, whatever. But what happens when interjection goes too far is what? It's what Agamemnon did in this story. Okay, I realize I projected the power onto the gods. You know what? So let's kill them off because there's no gods. I realize I gave the power to the dreams and all that. They're just my dreams. And when Franz makes that point so beautifully, the difference between projection and the... It's a slippery slope because we need to interject and say, yeah, there are qualities in me too. But to realize, unlike the, unlike the object relations people that says, well, they're just objects inside of me. The mother, imago, the father, object, and all that. That's, it's more than that because they're universals. They are ontological pieces to the world, to the psyche, and we begin to experience them initially through the other, through the projection. I can never be like my teacher. I, I can never dance like my the teacher. And slowly but surely. And then what do we do? And this is part of human, the hubris of the human condition. I'm better. I don't need him. Kill off Zeus. Kill off Hera. Kill them all. I don't need him. I don't even need to kill him. I don't have to think about him because I don't have to acknowledge him anymore because they're not powerful. I got it. It's me. Here we are. We're back. Yeah, takes us right back to the, the whole idea of primary narcissism, which is where, of course, we began this conversation. And really speaking to what Jung called the loss of the symbolic life, the capacity to take the image and be able to interact with it and be in relationship to it. So again, we keep coming back to that idea of being in relationship to something that is larger than ourselves, sometimes is invisible, but can definitely be tapped into if we're just willing to give ourselves the spaciousness and, and yeah. be with it. Yeah. I think that's your, that's a goal. Yeah. It's a goal, <laughs> yeah. It's a goal, and anything we can do to facilitate that is, is profound. I think you kind of discussions help it. Even if we, you know, I open, you open and to something. It's, we've done something meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and with that, we have come to the end of our time. So oh, God, great. you're so good at interviewing. You're wonderful to work with. Thank you. It's been really, really great to have this conversation and, and I agree with you, we need more. So I just wanna really thank you, Michael, for, for spending some time with me today and want to remind everybody, if you'd like to know more about Michael and his work, please go visit his website at SCC Institute. 
www.thrivingmindset.com. I mean, Michael, again, I know you've been really busy. There's a lot of international events that you've been hosting lately. You're going to be taking a group back to Italy, which you have oh, yes. decades in this in coming. Grande Ritorno, the big return back to Italy in, in July of 2017. We have a wonderful faculty. Um, Jim Hollis is coming, Ursula Wirtz from Switzerland, and uh, Joan Chaudera. Wonderful, wonderful people looking at soul and spirit in, in the aging process. Very exciting. And I've been to, to that event with you many times, with various different faculty, and it's just a lovely experience. And, and all the work that you're doing, Michael, is just contributing so much to bringing us all to greater consciousness. And I, again, really appreciate it. Thanks so much for spending some time. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. For more information, visit www.depthpsychologyalliance.com. <laughs>